Hey guys, so today I'm going to be telling you about how you should outline an investigation or an experiment or a practical. Uh, and then I'm going to give you examples on how you can um, kind of do this. So, number one, you need to have some background information. You need to know what you're talking about or what you're trying to prove or any of these things. Because if you don't, then you don't really know what you're doing in your practical. Then, since you know what the background information is and what you are expecting to get, get the equipment. What is the equipment that is going to help you uh, prove or check your hypothesis, okay? Then you need to have the variables. I'll tell you more about the variables in a second. Uh, and then you need to have the methods. Now, if you haven't done on the equipment and specify why you're using each piece of the equipment, in the method you should do so. And the method needs to be so, so clear and so detailed that anyone from the street or your grandmother or someone that never ever tried this investigation before and that has no knowledge whatsoever of physics or science can do, okay? So it needs to be like a recipe that anyone can try, okay? Risk assessment, I'll go more on that in a second. Table of results, the same. Graph, I'll tell you a little bit more. And then you finish off your practical with a conclusion and evaluation where you should say um, what uh, is the conclusion that you get from your data, if this matches the hypothesis or not, what is the uncertainty, possible causes for errors, um, how could you improve your investigation if you were to do it again. So all this stuff, okay? So variables. Now, with the variables, you have three types of variables. You have the independent, dependent, and control. And you need to take them into account every time you're doing an experiment. An experiment, yeah. So the independent variable is the one you change. So for example, if I have uh, different substances and I want to look at their pH, for example, then the independent variable is the material, uh, not the material, but the substances, the liquid that I'm testing. For example, I have three beakers. I did this practical uh, today. So for example, three beakers, I have no clue what is in, in the beakers, but I use the universal indicator to see if it's the acid, the alkali, or the water. So that's your independent variable, the one that you change. So you change the substance that you have in there in the beaker. The dependent variable is what you measure. Now, this could be a number like temperature or time taken or any of these things, or it could be a color. For example, in these acids, alkalis, and water experiments, so the neutral substance, the dependent variable was the color. We were not using the pH scale, so we were just looking at the color. So it was the color that the liquid would turn when you would use the universal indicator. So there you go, the one that you measure. And then the control variables are the ones that you keep the same to make the test fair. Now, you shouldn't just say that you use the control variables to keep the test fair. You kind of, you, that is what you use it for, but if you want to give a better answer, you should say something such as for comparison, or then you could say, because uh, if I don't control the control var variable, it will have an effect on the dependent variable. Or you could say, if I don't control, for example, the temperature of the room, this could affect the heating of my substance, for example. Okay, so this is how you should justify that something is a control variable. All right? For example, another great example of control variables is in a practical where you test insulation. So you should always have the same type of beaker with the same surface area, the same amount of water, uh, and then you'd only change the type of insulation you have around the beaker. So the insulation would be the dependent variable. The dependent variable would be the temperature change or the temperature drop um, from the beginning. And the control would be, again, the type of beaker, surface area, amount of water, all that stuff, OK? Now, whenever you're doing a practical, you also need to assess the risks. You don't want to start a practical without knowing what can go wrong and why and how to avoid it. So a good way to do a risk assessment is to have a table where you say, what is the risk? You name the risk. What can happen? So why is that a risk? And then how to avoid it. What are the steps you're going to, to, to take to ensure that everyone is safe in your practical, OK? So this is how you should do the risk assessment. If you want, you can also add another column where you say how likely or how dangerous the risk is, OK? So you could give a, a rating on how bad it, it would be or how likely it is that it happens in your experiment, all right? 
Now, when you get your table of results, the control variable doesn't really have a place where you have to put it. But the independent variables should always come before the dependent variable. And when you're doing the table, ensure that you uh, write the units, if there are units for the stuff that you're measuring, okay? Uh, you should also take in consideration decimal places and number of significant figures, all that stuff. Now, other stuff. So, when you draw a graph, when you draw a graph, you should actually uh, think in advance if it should be portrait or landscape. Now, because the independent variable should always go on the x-axis or the horizontal axis, and because the dependent variable should always go to the y-axis or the vertical axis, then you should have a portrait graph if the range of the dependent variable, so the y-axis, is larger than the range of the independent variable. So if you have a larger number of values and you need no more space in your scale for the dependent variable, then it should be a portrait graph to give you more space for that scale. On the other hand, you should do a landscape graph if the range of the independent variable or which means that uh, x-axis is larger than the range of the dependent variable. So again, if you need more space to get all the scale right for the independent variable, okay? More stuff. When you do a graph, should you uh, do a line graph or a bar chart? Now, if you have a continuous independent variable, you should draw a line graph, okay? And uh, when I say continuous variable is because kind of the, the stuff that you're measuring can flow from one to another smoothly. So length, age, height, weight. So you can have, for example, two kilograms or 2.1 kilograms, 2.2 kilograms. That's a continuous variable. On the other hand, if you get a categoric variable, then you should do a bar chart. Now, a categoric variable is something that is not continuous, obviously. It needs to be kind of in a group or a category. So, for example, color, material, age group. You cannot have yellow in a half. You cannot have lead half glass, okay? So, these are categoric variables, and therefore, you should do a bar chart, okay? Almost at the end. Now, something else that you need to know is sometimes you, you guys talk about accuracy and precision without quite knowing what it is. So, if you have a low accuracy, uh, what happens is that your results are far away from the real value. In this example here, my real value, my goal is right at the center, right? The center of these darts, right? So, low accuracy, you're far off of the place, okay? High accuracy, where it is, is you're close to that place, to the real value. Precision is how close the values are from each other. So right here in the first picture, I have a low precision because all the values that I took are far away from each other. On the second picture, I have a high precision, even though my accuracy is low. I may be far away from the real value, accuracy, but my results are very close to each other. So my experiment was quite precise in that regard, okay? High accuracy and low precision. So it means that I'm close to the real value, but the results are a little bit far off. And high accuracy and high precision means that I'm close to the real value and my results are very close to each other. So there you go. The baseline or the background information on how to do an investigation or how to actually do a good investigation. Up to my next video. Be happy and healthy. Bye.